Jeff. Um, don't get the last name, I guess, but I'll be Jeff today. Uh, I, you know, so I talked to Mike and Mike, the, the dynamic duo here, about what is uh, most effective for these talks. And so what I've got is just a series of stories. As Mike said, I started my career at IBM, went through Google, and now I'm uh, working for about the last six and a half years of my own startup. Uh, give, you, give you a couple of stories from what it's really like in the trenches at some of these big companies when you're doing something new on how it really works. So my story all begins, oh wait, before that, Connect Week, people coming to Connect Week next week? I'm on the board of NA Pasadena. There's a hundred events uh, starting, I wanna say this weekend, uh, going through all next week, amazing events, Connect Week 2018. If you don't know about it, please uh, find some great events and check them out, it's gonna be a lot of fun. I think I've got like eight of them on my calendar and I'm not here Sunday through Wednesday. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of great things uh, for you to do. I don't think you can read any of these, but that's okay. All right. So my entrepreneurial journey started at Stanford, as many do. I was a computer systems major. Does anybody know what this building is called? Bill Gates Computer Science Building at Stanford. People really hate that it's the Bill Gates Building. They don't like Bill Gates at Stanford. But Bill Gates Computer Science Building. So I got my degree in computer systems engineering. It's 2002, the height of the dot-com boom. Google is handing out boxers in the middle of campus to recruit engineers, and I chose to go work at IBM. It was maybe not the most entrepreneurial of choices. Does anybody know what? Went backwards, huh? Let's see. Wait, we're not to Google yet. Does anybody know what these things are? Yes. Has anybody ever used an AS400? <laughs> Do you know what an AS400 is? Like a little mini version of a mainframe? That's what I sold at IBM. Right? Does anybody know what this is? The AS400 people yelling out if you know what this is down here. You ever go to the airline and they ask you, what's your name? And they seem to type 500 characters to enter it into the computer. And you go, what are you doing? They say, where are you flying? And 500 more characters. That is an old terminal system called 5250. And that's what I sold at IBM. High tech, middle of the Google age. I sold this. It was great. Uh, after a few years, about three years at IBM, I said, you know, this is, yeah, this is not what I thought I'd go into high tech, quite what I thought I would be, be doing. Um, and I got a job interview at Google. This is like my wife compared it to getting the golden ticket to Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Um, I don't know why it keeps doing that. Uh, it's not quite that good. Oh, we're not there yet, we're not there yet. We're gonna go backwards. Oh wait, we're going forwards. Yeah, yeah, get a preview of everything that's coming. All right, so this is the guy that hired me at Google, a guy named Rajan Shep. And this was, anybody know what this is? It's Google Search Appliance. Right, so I was hired into the Enterprise Technology Group, and I said, what do you want me to do? And they said, do you know the Google Search Appliance? I said, no. They said, it's a little box you put in your network, and then you get Google Search. We're gonna do that, but for Gmail. I said, great, you're gonna have a box that runs Gmail for people's businesses? They said, no. I said, what are you gonna do? He said, we can't tell you. <laughs> but do you want the job? I said, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so there you go, I don't know what I'm doing. I come in, and it turns out this was G Suite. So did anybody here have a business that uses G Suite, Gmail for your business? All right, I was the first non-product engineering person at Google to work on that product. I worked on that for six years at Google. And my first week, Raj, so they get this great uh, tradition at Google where uh, somebody picks you up, they're your buddy, and they take you home. <laughs> <laughs> it really doesn't like something today. It's just like freaking out. Uh, it really doesn't, so they pick you up, they bring you back, and so Raj says, all right, we got a meeting next week uh, to see if we're gonna launch the product. And I said, you just hired me to sell the product. What do I do if they say no? He says, I don't know, we'll figure it out. I said, okay. So he comes back, I say, Raj, how did it go? Are we gonna have a product? Or like, am I out on the street looking for a job? He says, we're good. they said we're good to go, but Sergey wants to call it Hostorama. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, G Suite was almost called Hostorama. And I said, Raj, I've got a career to think about here. I can't be the Hostorama guy, <laughs> right? Fortunately, we, um, we calendar stalked Marissa, uh, Meyer, and we got it named to Google Apps, which was the name at the time. I've never seen it do this before, so it's kind of weird. Is there anything plugged in? There's nothing plugged in. No, it's just it's wireless. So, so I start working at Google, and about six months in, you know, we've got we got to set our targets. How many G Suite users are we going to get? Right? Like how big is this thing going to be? And it's Google, so it can't be small. Um, and we start we start talking to people and doing deals, and we get a call from the Ministry of Education in Egypt. Right? So Egypt says. We're gonna we're gonna put every student in Egypt on your title slide. Uh, we're gonna put every student in Egypt on Google Apps. And so my team's like, great, you've got a target to hit 20 million people on Google Apps in Egypt in the next year. Good luck. A year later, 
I want to I want to take some guesses here. How many people do you think we have? Nineteen. Yeah, somebody saw a slide. Nineteen. <laughs> not million. Not thousand. Not hundred. We had nineteen students. And I'm on the phone with the ministry, and I go, "Why do we have nineteen students?" They say, "Jeff, how do you assign usernames and passwords?" And I said, "Well, there's an API. You can upload a CSV. They said, "No, no. How do you pick what a username should be?" And I was like, oh, God, we've got a problem here. And then they called me and they said, Jeff, I need $50,000. I said, why do you need $50,000? We need to buy printers and paper because we have to mail people their usernames and passwords because we don't know how else to get them to them. So can you send me $50,000 to buy an IBM printer and a couple of reams of paper so I can mail out usernames and passwords to 20 million students? So just suffice it to say, six months into Google, I have now gotten Eric Schmidt to fly his G5 to Egypt to sit in a very boring-looking meeting <laughs> and sign a deal with the Egyptian Minister of Education uh, for 20 million users, and I have delivered 19. <laughs> My career prospects at Google did not feel that good at that particular moment. I was not feeling real confident. And then I met this guy. This is a guy named Adrian Sanger. Uh, he was the CIO at Arizona State University. We had maybe... <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a comedy show. You guys didn't know that. Uh, it's a comedy show. So here's what I say here. So I walk in. So I've, I've been out here for a year now selling Google Apps, and nobody will buy it. Everybody's got all these reasons. China's going to steal all your students' information. You're going to sell it to Procter and Gamble to sell more, uh, you know, whatever. And Adrian, I walk into Adrian's office. So I finally get my head of product management, my, my director of product manager, said, Raj, you got to come with me. You got to understand how hard this is. Nobody wants this stuff, right? It's really hard to sell. He's like, I can't be that hard. I'll come with you. It's great. I walk in, and Adrian says, So when you guys. When are you guys going to announce this next new product? And we say October, and this was August. He's like, I got to be a part of that. What's it going to take? I said, Adrian, you're going to have to, in the next three weeks, go live, integrate with single sign on, create 50,000 accounts for your students, and, and be ready to support publicly. He says, Great, Ron, that's your job. What else? <laughs> no joke. And so I'm sitting in the meeting, like, What the hell? Now, and I walk out of the meeting, and my product manager's like, I don't understand what you're talking about. This is easy. Why don't we have 50 of these schools signed up? So, this is why. This is why, because I'm using Google Slides. No. It's actually PowerPoint, it's not Google Slides. I'm not going to throw Google on the bus. You know, on video and everything. Uh, so, they went live. Uh, you know, that started a trend. Uh, he was a brave first soul who went out on the cloud. This is cloud computing before there was the phrase cloud computing. And uh, four years later, 70% of the universities in the United States were using this for their student email system, about 50% for their faculty email system. That was a crazy rocket ship ride, right? But it started off with 20 million expectations and 19 delivered, which is to say to all the entrepreneurs, if you think the big companies coming after your space have it all figured out, let me tell you, I promise that they don't. So uh, four years later, I'm sitting here running this business. I got to meet Grover. Sesame Street came to Google and I got my photo with Grover. I got the key to a city in Peru and I got to drive a biodiesel bus all around the country. Life was good. Right? I got 70% market share, things are going great, I'm making good money, I'm hanging out, I gotta go to Giza and see the pyramids. And Raj calls me up and says, Jeff, I'm leaving apps, I'm doing this new thing called Chromebooks, and nobody's heard of a Chromebook. I say, you need a business guy? And so I left what I was doing for this crazy thing called Chromebooks. Anybody here ever used a Chromebook? Hey, all right. So I was the go-to-market business guy on Chromebooks before there were such a thing as Chromebooks. This is the Anybody remember the name of the very original first Chromebook ever made? I can talk to you now. It's called a CR48. CR48. It's a really crappy computer, but uh, it was a really amazing idea. And now in the Google way, they say, okay, you're responsible for Chromebooks. How many are we going to sell? And I'm like, I don't know. We got three guys on, maybe a thousand or two thousand the first year. No, no, no. You can't do that because then soon will say this is too boring. We don't want to do that. So we came up with a model to sell about a quarter million Chromebooks on the same first year. I had no, we had no idea how to do that. And the fun part of that, and this is where big companies are really interesting, is we had to do cash flow projections. And the cash flow projection for my business was negative $2 billion <laughs> in the first year. Oh so we had to go to a meeting to tell the CFO, what I need you to do is give me $2 billion. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, and that was actually one of the beginnings to where I decided maybe it was time for me to, to move on from Google because I didn't actually go to a meeting with the CFO. I went to a meeting that was to prepare for a meeting that was itself to prepare for a meeting that was to prepare for the meeting with the CFO to ask for $2 billion. When you're asking for $2 billion, a couple of prep meetings is probably okay. Uh, but it started to feel pretty 
pretty challenging, right? Like everything we did, all of a sudden it was like, it took 15 meetings to get things done. Uh, and it got a little boring. So that's when I first started thinking about that. One more story for you guys. You can see this is your pile of Chromebooks. So again, if you think big companies have it all figured out, of course, when we make the prediction, we will sell 200,000 Chromebooks, well, what do we do? We bought and made 200,000 Chromebooks. We did not sell 200,000 Chromebooks. So we had piles of Chromebooks. And the operating system got out of date. We said, shoot, we got 100,000 Chromebooks in a warehouse in Atlanta with an operating system that's out of date. What do we do? We went to Home Depot and got a bunch of guys out front and handed them USB drives and had them stick them into the machines and put them back in the boxes. And then we called the manufacturer who actually ripped the keyboards off of a number of them because we bought, you know, being an international company, you can't launch this in the US. What you find out is when you make, when you make hardware, it's a little different, right? So we made German keyboards and French keyboards and UK keyboards, but it turned out the German and the French and the UK people didn't want Chromebooks. The US schools did. <laughs> we had to rip all the European keyboards off, put new American keyboards on so we didn't have to take a total loss on our millions of dollars of Chromebooks, right? And this was, this is now I consider a very successful business. But let me tell you, when I was writing uh, checks for ripping off of keyboards of Chromebooks so that they could be used in the US instead of Germany where they had the keyboard made for, did not feel <laughs> like a successful business. I felt pretty dangerous. Uh, and so this is about the point where I said, you know, I, maybe maybe I've, I've had enough of the big bureaucracy. I wanna try my own thing. So I've now gone from a company of uh, IBM and I joined about 150,000 people. Google when I joined was about 5,000 people. And I went to a company of five. Not 50, not 500, not 5,000, just five of us. The company's called Upstart. This is a picture of one of our early days. Um, this is Dave Gerard. Uh, you'll see why I'm just pointing those people out later when I tell you my, what I've learned. Dave Gerard, uh, as I like to say, he hired me into Google. He was the head of Google Enterprise. He hired me out of Google. And my mother-in-law thanks him for one of the two. We're trying to turn around on the second one. We're going to get it there eventually. This is our team. Uh, the amazing thing about this is only three people in this photo have left the company, and the other, let me count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, are on the executive leadership team to this day. This is a picture from when that was the entirety of the company. We're 130 people now, right? So the people were really everything, and what convinced me to leave was getting to go do something new and do it with people I trusted. So people will ask me, what does it feel like the first time you, know, you leave a big company, you're at Google, you're doing something new, but like, they're gonna pay your paycheck whether it works or not, right? Like we had 100,000 Chromebooks sitting around nobody wanted. I still had a paycheck coming in, right? So what, what does it feel like? The only thing I can compare it to is this. This is my first son, my wife is here and she's very upset with me that I got a picture of my first son but not my second son, I have two sons. I love them both equally. But this moment was unique because this was the day my son was born and we're at the hospital and how many of you have kids? So, okay, everybody has kids. As you know, like nurses are in and out, doctors are in and out. It's kind of this whirlwind of activity. But that night, they wrapped them up, they put them in the bassinet, and they all walked out of the room. And my wife and I kind of looked at each other, and we looked at the baby, and we said, like, who takes care of him now? <laughs> right? Like, who's responsible if something goes wrong? Uh, and the answer is, you are. And that's exactly what it feels like when you walk into that conference room with four people on the first day in your startup, and you go, Who's responsible for it? And fill in the blank with whatever you want. The answer is you, and you feel equally unprepared as you do on the first day of being a parent to the task of managing your company. And that is absolutely uh, how I felt uh, on the first day of Upstart. This is gonna be a really funny video. I can't wait to watch this at the end. So let me tell you a couple of stories from Upstart and then I'll wrap it up and you guys can ask me some questions. So Upstart, we started off with this really interesting idea for a financial model, which was that uh, people would and be able to exchange a percentage of their future income for cash today. So not a fixed loan payment, but literally a fixed percentage of your income. And we, our plan was to work through universities to support entrepreneurs with this kind of financing model as an alternative to student debt. And so I went around to a lot of universities. This is a Rhode Island School of Design. I spent a lot of time at RISD. Uh, I was flying around. I knew a lot of schools from my Google days. And three months into the job, what I realized is I have to fire myself because this is a terrible go-to-market strategy and it will never work. So my first act as an employee uh, my new company is to fire myself from the job I hired myself into and then figure out what the heck I ought to be doing next, right? And I think that's another kind of prototypical entrepreneur experience is whatever you think the plan is, it's probably not the plan, right? And you've got to be able to adapt and figure out what you're going to do next. The fun part for me of being an entrepreneur, this is one of my, it's a very small story, but I think it really, you uh, think of perspective on the difference between being in a big company and being in a, a very small startup. So my CEO and I were out one day browsing some websites and we got one of these little chat pop-ups. You guys know these things? Hi, would you like to talk to? I'm like, that's pretty cool, we should do that. 
And then we started thinking Google mode. Well, we should like do some evaluation and this and that. And we went, what are we talking about? So we went to olark.com. We downloaded five snippets of JavaScript. And in an hour, we were chatting with real customers and learning things from them about what they wanted from our business and how they liked it. And I, went, I looked and was like, we did that in an hour. That would have been six months of debate at Google. And in an hour, we made a decision, executed it, and we're learning something. Right, and that kind of freedom to learn quickly and execute, that's something that no big company can emulate. Trust me, and Google is as good at them as, as any of them are trying, uh, but they can't do it. Now, the inevitable startup story, of course, is this is my team in Sun Valley after about two years. And Sun Valley has a special place in our hearts. We take a number of companies' key trips there. But this one was very important uh, because uh, at about midnight, we started uh, having a conversation between uh, the three co founders and myself. And we started saying, you know, this whole income share agreement thing is not working so well. What are we going to do? We've done $2 million of it. We can't get the money to fund it. We can't find people who want it. We've got a lot of intellectual property tied up. And we chose at that moment uh, to move our business from income share agreements, where we're taking a portion of people's income for capital today, to a, a more straight uh, installment loan lending business. And that was a, you know, this has been one of those things that have been swirling around the company for three months. People were talking about it. It was debated here and there. And we kind of all got together. We were maybe 50 employees at the time. And we said, we just have to make a decision. We got to live with it. And we got to, everybody has to commit. So it took probably three hours. So we're supposed to go skiing at eight in the morning. At three in the morning, I'm standing in the living room of my CEO's house in Sun Valley debating, are we going to do this? We're we not going to do it. We kind of all put our hands in the middle. And we're like, we're in, right? This is it. It's done. No more debate. No more questioning. You got to commit to the decision. And so we made the decision and we committed to it. And we went from funding, uh, a little under $2 million in our first year and a half of operation funding, uh, you know, now $160 million a month in loan obligations. So it was a immediately and obviously successful. Our first month uh, offering loans, we originated more than double what we had in our first 12 months with the income share agreement. But I, but I can tell you that on the front side of that pivot, it felt a lot like we might be killing the business. Right? We were sitting there, we were going, will this work? And if not, we have something that is working for which we've raised money, of which we have customers, and we are choosing to end it and go down this new path and we don't really know what will be there. And it felt, I cannot only tell you, existential at the time. And you look back on it and you're like, well, I mean, this was obvious, right? Like your first month, you did more business than your first year. Like this was a no brainer. And at the time it felt like a life or death decision that had no obvious or easy answer. And we stressed about it a lot. We stressed about it after that moment, but I think the most important thing we did was we committed. We said, we've, we've rationalized it, we've, we've thought about it, we've made the smart choice and we're gonna commit to it and follow that path forward. And it's, you know, it's turned out well, uh, but it was not obvious at the time that it would. So now I'm gonna take a short opportunity to tell you a little bit about what Upstart does because I think it's pretty interesting. So we have a mission statement as all companies must have. I think we have Patagonia Vest with our logo on them, which I think also is something, I think we put like 50 of these in a room, like a startup spontaneously just emerges from the uh, Patagonia Vest and then <laughs> laying in the middle of the floor. Uh, but our, our mission statement is to enable effortless credit based on true risk. And so we really saw two gaps in the market for credit, which is one, it's really hard to apply, right? To this day, if you want a loan of the type I offer and your bank is Wells Fargo, and you go on the website and say, can you give me a loan? They say, why don't you call this number and schedule an appointment to come into a branch and speak to a banker? And that's not a particularly good answer in our estimation for what you should do. So effortless credit based on true risk. The other thing we realize is that most credit is done based on FICO scores. Anybody know their FICO score? Right? This is how people lend. If you go to a bank, I've seen dozens of bank credit models, and they basically look at your FICO and your income, and that's it. And it turns out that FICO is not the best predictor for credit risk. In fact, it's a pretty mediocre predictor, particularly for large types of people, a large categories. New immigrants to the country don't have established credit history. Young people don't have established credit history. Uh, there's a lot of bias in the FICO system itself. If you look across the kind of different classes of people, you'll see dis distinguished uh, dis distinctions there. And so we said we can do a better job applying modern machine learning right, and alternative sources of data to the question of who is a good borrower and who is a bad borrower. And so that is what we set out to do. And we first thought we needed a new financial product to do that, an income share agreement. And it turned out that we just needed a better way of offering people existing financial products, i.e. installment loans. So we offer three, five, and seven year fixed term installment loans. About 80% of our loans are used to refinance high interest rate credit card debt. So if you have credit card debt, you know, right, you get $15,000 in debt, our average loan is $12,000, you come to us, we get you from 22 points to around 15 points on average. We get you from a revolving, what do I have to pay to be done in three years to a fixed payment, a fixed term, and when you're done, you're done, right? And the vast majority of our borrowers end up coming out of the debt through this process. So we feel good about that. 
Uh, but what we did, so I'm going to show you a slide here. This is a chart. I apologize. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a real graph with data, and I said I wouldn't do that. I'm going to do it once. Uh, well, twice. Um, but this is showing you loss rates. So this is FICO scores. If you know where your FICO score is, you can roughly estimate how likely a bank is to think you're defaulting by looking at this gray line. And these are pools of loans that have been originated by many of our peers in the online lending industry. And what you see is high FICO scores, low defaults. Low FICO scores, high defaults high interest rates, right? And what we found is that when we apply machine learning techniques, we can lend to people at these teal dots, which is to say our 620 to 640 population of borrowers defaults at less than 10%. The 620 to 640 population of borrowers for our closest peer set in the industry defaults at about 22%, right? So we have more than cut in half the losses while lending to a population that normal techniques would tell you are super risky because we can look at more sources of data it's just a credit file alone, by the way. You've got a FICO score. The credit file gives me over 800 pieces of data on each individual I talked about. And yet, most financial institutions will look at a singular number and say, this is all I need to know about, about Jeff when I want to lend to him. And the reality is those 800 pieces of data tell you a lot more than a single number when you can look at them in intelligent ways. And that's what we've done. The second thing we wanted to do was to simplify the borrower experience, right? To make this effortless. So uh, about 60% of our loans today, when, when this Q3 2018 finishes, I go through a fully automated process, which is you go to my website, you apply, you're given the rate, you click a button, you're approved, and there's no human intervention anywhere in the process on the upstart side from the moment you apply to the moment you're actually approved and receive your funds. The average time it takes a borrower to go through this process is uh, 28 minutes. <laughs> right, 28 minutes. It is a lot quicker than the nearest appointment that Wells Fargo will give you when you dial their 1-800 number to walk into their branch to ask somebody about the process. About 40% of our borrowers are required, uh, for one reason or another, to upload some form of documentation. We think they're maybe fraudulent. They told us they had $100,000. We looked at their bank statements and they got $2,000 deposits a month. Those two things don't match up. Uh, they're asked to upload some form of documentation. On average, it takes 51 hours for those borrowers to complete. It's so about two days, two and a half days, right, when there's some sort of manual review and intervention in the process. And some of those are borrowers that, frankly, are probably fraudulent and we don't want to complete the process because we can't prove that they're fraudulent, we have a high concern. So what we'll typically do is, is we'll ask for them for a lot of documentation, which means when they go away, that they probably have admitted that they were being fraudulent and we don't expect them to come back. And that's included in the part of this. So, you know, this is obviously, we think, a dramatically better experience for the borrower. It results in much higher customer satisfaction rates and much higher completion rates of the process. Um, but no startup story is complete without the ever-present roller coaster analogy. This is my family at Splash Mountain. My mother, when she sees this YouTube video, will be very upset. She's not fond of this particular photo of her. Uh, my dad likes it. He thinks he's having a good old time. My son looks some mixture of excited and terrified. Uh, and I think this is about the best, uh, best statement of what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Sitting in the front with a great row view of what's coming, not really knowing what it is, uh, and terrified and excited all at once. Um, we are now a company that does about $10 million in revenue a month. We do about $160 million in lending a month. Uh, we have about 130 employees. So we have, uh, by some measures, you know, come through to a, a relatively successful place. The, the company has reached profitability, which is a huge milestone, I think, for any startup, to the point where you're not using other people's money, you're, you're spending your own money. That's a big, a big point in time. Uh, but it is, still feels like a roller coaster ride. I'll give you one example of that, which is I flew out uh, to DC. We were having a big customer meeting, and, you know, I walked out of that customer meeting and I said, I think we've got a huge, like, it's like you're on a real high, right? Like, we're going to do a big deal. We've got a, we've got a huge opportunity here. It feels great. Everything lined up. And I get a phone call and I'm at the airport. And I think, I think we might have a problem with our data. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I won't go into the detail, but let's just say it terrified me. And I went in a span of five minutes from thinking, I have conquered the world to, oh my God, we're all going to be unemployed tomorrow and we're going out of business. And that is, even at this stage, I think a very real experience for startups is like, it's not, you're at the big companies, like you have a good week, you have a bad week, you're kind of operating in this kind of like highs and lows. Startups are like these kind of highs and lows, right? And within an hour, you can go from, we are going to be the next Google to I'm unemployed tomorrow and back and down again, and you don't know. And you kind of have to be ready for that, right? That the roller coaster analogy is often used, but it's very real. And I will say it happens at the big companies when you're being an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur, sorry, but it doesn't happen to the same degree, right? I mean, you are, I've often heard, this is another analogy, there's a great TED talk out there that four myths about parenting. I don't know if you guys have, if you haven't watched it, it's fun. But they'll say, you know, are parents happier or not? It's a kind of scary question. I don't know if I want the answer. 
And what they say is the highs are high and the lows are low, right? So your normal person, they go out to a great night out, they come home and they're a little, whatever, you know, like they got kind of here. And the parents are like, you know, your kid walks for the first time, right? And then your kid says they hate you. And you have this much higher <laughs> highs. We all have this all of us, it's okay. But you know, you have these highs and lows that just take you to much different places. And I think that's the difference to me of being an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur is my highs are higher. Uh, my lows are lower, uh, but overall, I, I'm happier doing what I do than I was before. So my last two slides, I must really like it because I'm doing it again. We are now moving away from being a direct-to-consumer business to being a B2B SaaS company, taking the technology we built, licensing it to banks and financial institutions so that more people can uh, benefit from the better underwriting, the better experiences we built. Uh, this is the business I run now. Well, not that one, that's the one I fired myself from. Uh, but this is the business I run now. Uh, and I, I enjoy it. So I'm, there must be something in me that insists on whenever it gets to be somewhat stable, I'm done and moving on. So I seem that seems to be the only uh, constant in my career. Uh, but I, so I will give you five my five lessons that I've learned that I think are are things to take away about any entrepreneurial journey. And then if there's time left, I don't know how you have time. Uh, Mike will ask me questions. But number one, uh, find people you can trust. You will notice this. I pointed out a lot of individuals that have made a huge difference in my career path, from customers to partners to bosses. And if there's anything I rely on when my wife and I were talking about, uh, should I go to Upstart? The thing that made me confident was that I knew the guy who started it and I trusted him. When he made me an offer, if you ever negotiated a startup offer, by the way, and like how much equity should you ask for? I asked five people. I got things that were three orders of magnitude difference in what I should expect for an equity offer, which is kind of nuts. Like there's no good rule of thumb. And I said, I trust my CEO to do right by me today and tomorrow. That trust is something that's invaluable in customers and partners and, and teammates. So, Number one, find people you can trust. That's the only thing that you can really count on. Number two, nobody really, you, you heard my stories, right? If you think the big guys have it all together, they don't. When you look at your competitor's article in Fast Company or Wired or TechCrunch or whatever, the reporter is writing what they want you to hear. And the reporter would write an amazing story about you too because you would not tell them how staff meeting went or how close you were to missing payroll or about that data breach that nobody knows about, but you were worried about. You don't say that, right? I often, I've heard it said before that, uh, you know, you see people's best selves. It's like the Instagram photo of themselves in the press, and you see yourself in the mirror before your first shower, right? Those are different <laughs> pictures, but you compare them like they're the same thing, and they're not. So everybody you think has it all together, they don't really have it all together. Number two, plan, even though your plan will be wrong. I think it was Eisenhower, although someone's gonna correct me, I'm sure that I'm wrong, who said, uh, plans are useless, but planning is invaluable. Right, I 100% prescribe that the process of planning is useful. I have screwed up pretty much every plan I've ever made. We've never met one. We've exceeded a few. We've missed a lot. Uh, but the process of planning helps you understand what's really involved, what the assumptions are that are going into what you're doing. And there's really no way around the value of planning itself, even though you just have to be ready that you know whatever you thought will happen indefinitely will not happen in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it is worse than you think, uh, but probably not that bad. So like I've been a lot of moments where I thought, oh my God, it's going down. Uh, and, and your heart hearts like, it's probably gonna be fine. No, it's probably bad, but it's probably not as bad as you think. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, and then my last one, just do it. Uh, I remember uh, when I chose to leave Google, it was like this really stressful decision, right? And I, do I do it, do I not do it? I asked my mom, I asked my dad, I asked my wife. My wife will tell you I already made my mind up and I was asking people just to tell me what I wanted to hear and give me confidence. There's probably some truth to that. Uh, right, but the moment I remember most is uh, there was a, a really tough manager at Google. He was never my manager, but I knew him very well. It was a guy named Michael Locke, uh, and I wa I saw my you know like, so I got to Google. Uh, I, I went into my exit interview. Right? I leave my laptop. I take off my badge. I put my badge on the table, and because I, I was doing Chromebooks, so I had like eight laptops piled up for all the hardware I had. Put my Android phone down, and I'm walking out the door. Um, and I walked out, and I you know how do you feel in that moment, right? Do you feel terrified, and you do? You feel like you made a big mistake. And what I can tell you, I walked out and Michael Locke was standing there and he was like, he said, free as a bird. And that's exactly how I felt. I felt free as a bird, like I was on the other side of a tough choice, but I was on the right side and everything was only gonna get better from there. And so all I can say is if you're thinking about, is it worth it? It will never feel before you make the choice like it is. But once you've done it, uh, it's absolutely worth it on the other side. Uh, so I didn't put a Nike swoosh up here because that's uh, copyrighted and this is going on video and on YouTube. But I will say, if you've got the chance, just do it. It is incredibly valuable experience, and I've enjoyed absolutely every second of it along the way. So with that, I am done. And I'm happy to go back to you. Thank you.
Mike? What? what? You see this? They're like, they're like no. flipping back never. and forth. I've never, never seen that. <laughs> <laughs> Your energy is palpable. That's awesome. Uh, really enjoyed that presentation. Uh, the transition from entrepreneurship, uh, working with Google, and then moving on to your own uh, entrepreneurial endeavor. Uh, and actually creating a really important system here with Upstart and uh, identifying a, a product market fit that solves residual problems yeah. given that your competitors are basically like setting up people for failure, it seemed like that. At least that was apparent to me on the graph. That was a really cool graph, uh, by the way. Uh, and also lessons learned. Um, and yeah, just do it. Uh, like I say that all the time because whether you are motivated or dreading the process, it doesn't really change the fact that work needs to be done. And I think that's what Nike really has kind of like tapped into, and I think that's why their logo or their tagline will never really change because it is always relevant across all boards, whether it's athleticism or entrepreneurship. Um, and we really appreciate you just your, your candor <laughs> and that and that recap. I mean, yeah, there's there's just a, a lot there that we can relate to. Um, we're gonna start Q and A now. So if you have a question, John, walk around with the mic. We should find uh, your questions answered. However, if you have a comment or a story that you want to share, we will yank the mic away from you. You guys can share that stuff after the Q&A section. Don't apply to me too? Uh, no, no, you can rant as much as you want. That's the purpose here. Yeah, anyway, here we go. Hey, thank you, that was a great talk. Um, I spent a good part of my time nudging people not to go into higher education. Um, <laughs> Largely because I find that they don't really know what they want to do and they're just going to spend a lot of money because they think it's the right thing that they're supposed to do. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you were mentioning about how your, it sounded like part of your inspiration to start the company was about kind of changing the model about student loans and that's very personally relevant. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's interesting. One of my co-founders is a guy named Paul Gu. And Paul was one of the original Peter Thiel 20 under 20 files. I don't know if you guys, anybody familiar with the 20 under 20 program? Very, it's a little controversial. Peter Thiel, PayPal co-founder, uh, gave people 100 grand to drop out of college uh, to start their own businesses. Wow. Uh, Paul took 100 grand, dropped out of college. Uh, his parents are still not happy that he did not complete his degree, uh, but he is doing pretty well with us here at Upstart. So I, it's a tough question. Our, our initial goal was to change uh, student lending from interest-based installment loans to this income share agreement. The idea there is if you're not making a lot of money, i.e. you choose to join a startup and they don't pay you a lot, your payment is fixed as a percentage of your income. So it's never unbearable, right? Because 2% of your income is 2% of your income. Right now, the, the lenders take a risk that if you never make any money, um, they, they lose their money, right? They don't get it back. But I think on the tail end, what we really believed was that entrepreneurs fail, but they don't fail as people, right? Their businesses fail. And then they go on and they're like, they do other things and they don't sit around not making money for 30 years. And so that felt like a safe bet to us. I think the student lending problem is big, but the goal there was, again, to make it possible for people to, after having, you know, accumulated student debt to still feel like entrepreneurship was open to them and not that they had to go put, you know, I, I hear so many people, particularly in law school, are like, I'm gonna go for my five years at the firm and pay off my student loan and then I'll go do what I really wanna do. And five years always turns into 10, turns into 15 and the paycheck is too big to walk away from and it feels uh, impossible. And I think that's a, a very real problem. I, I'm not quite at the point of uh, encouraging people not to go to higher ed. I would say though, that be very careful about the debt you take on going to higher ed because it does limit your future optionality. And if there's anything I like, it's keeping lots of doors open to you in the future. And, and that debt tends to close doors that you might like to be open in the future as opposed to opening more doors for you. Uh oh, here's a, this is going to be a tough question. Be kind. Hi, um, I'm going to share a little story. I'm Ivy Keltner. I am Jeff's spouse. And um, I've known him now since we were 18 at college. And one of the things that he's always been driven by in terms of all of his career choices is how much of an impact can I make? And whether that's been at Google in terms of how can I really fundamentally change education and democratize it to really improve the technological opportunities to improve access to especially kids who are either disadvantaged through their local schools or different opportunities. And then when he went to um, Upstart, one of the things that he thought about was, well, in terms of the loan, you know, the loan application process and lending, you know, people profit when people, when others fail, right? When consumers fail. And so Jeff was really excited about this. He was excited about the idea of aligning profit with a positive incentive. So you succeed, the company succeeds when other people succeed. And I think that passion, that commitment to the mission and the impact in terms of societal impact and making sure that 
as you develop these algorithms for machine learning, that it is fair and that certain populations that have historically been marginalized are included. That's something that drives him. And it's been exciting to see you know, the ups and downs, but what powers him through, at least from the personal perspective, has been this commitment and this mission to make things more fair. Now you guys can all see that I'm married up. <laughs> a perfect segue to my question, and that is, um, when you were building Upstart, did you consciously develop an organizational culture, or did it just happen, and have you had a thoughtful way of creating that culture as you grow? It's a great question. Culture is uh, it's one of those things everybody talks about, but it's really hard to define and nail down exactly what it is. We have the benefit that most of our executive team came from Google. So a lot of the operational pieces of culture, so you guys are familiar with OKRs, we use OKRs, which were heavily used at Google. Uh, a lot of our performance reviews and what we think about things uh, were driven. So kind of the practical uh, realities of culture, like how do you operate day to day, how do meetings run, how do you measure success, how do you keep the business on track? Those were a lot of things we borrowed from Google. We tried to throw out the parts we didn't like. We thought that Google was a pretty well operated company as a whole and gave us a good model. The other part that I think is really important is uh, kind of what my, my wife alluded to, which is having a mission that drives you, that aligns the purpose behind what you're doing. And for us, you know, in the student lending space, in the income shares, it was really about freeing people to pursue what they wanted to do, right? From debt that was shackling them in some ways and, and limiting their choices. Uh, as we get into the installment loans, I think what drives us now is the understanding that almost all the profits in the credit card industry come from people who revolve their balances month to month. Right? Those who get a credit card and go, I'm gonna pay this off, I'm never gonna carry a balance. Uh, but all the profits, all of them come from people who revolve balances. And so the idea that we are taking people who have accumulated this debt and feel stuck in having this burden that they don't know how to get out of and giving them a path where we can both lower the cost that they have to pay to eliminate that debt and also give them a, moving from a revolving debt where it's like, what's your credit card bill, $35? How much do you have to pay to be done in four years? I don't know. Even my data scientists have trouble answering that question, right? To a place where it's like pay $350 a month for four years or five years, whatever your payment is, and you're finished. That's very empowering for people. And I think that mission of starting with the consumer, we, you could think of our, our primary customers, the people who buy our loans, right? The banks we work with. But we've always focused on the consumer and how do we do something that's helpful to the consumer. And that I think helps you when you've got a difficult decision, do we do A or B? That's your, your true north, right? That's your, your guiding principle that keeps everybody aligned. And that's what gets people motivated. Because there's days when you wake up and it feels like a spreadsheet and a process and, and a thing and you don't, you know, you're not excited about it. But you know, we actually have, every week, we put up a, a review from a borrower from Credit Karma. Uh, if you guys go to Credit Karma, they have reviews. If we read a review or a comment that came in from our site, and that really inspires the team to say that that's what matters to us, right? And everything is in service to that. And I think that's an important part of culture too, is having something that, that drives you forward outside of just how do I maintain the business or run the business, but the why is the business important to be maintained or be run or be around? And you know that kind of has to be a core element as well. But then I think it is important that you start, and we've been somewhat thoughtful though, often when you're running a business, as you guys know, as it grows rapidly, you don't have time to structure your culture as well as you'd like. And so reactive when we see it and figuring out the right processes or, or consistent ways of operating across different teams that make us feel like a cohesive unit and not a whole bunch of different groups doing different things in different ways is also really important. It's something that's easy to overlook until it rears its head because you start to feel things feeling different. You just gotta kind of slowly but surely get there. I think we benefited from having a real foundation at the executive level from having worked together before, knowing how each other worked and, and having a kind of a common set of, of language. You mentioned that there were several events that were completely panic inducing, but then with time and looking back on them, you just looked at completely differently. And it's one of the points you hit on at the end. Is there anything specific that you can find yourself doing now to at least sort of get that perspective a little earlier as opposed to always having <laughs> it? Or am I asking a philosophical question? <laughs> well, if we can be philosophical, it's fine. Uh, you know, I think you do. I mean, and you, the reality is that in any given instance, you go, okay, you know, we're not, we're gonna set up some stuff so we don't do that again. But the next time you have a panic inducing moment is usually not caused by whatever caused the last one, right? So as my boss would say, it's fine to screw up, just don't screw up the same way twice, right? And so we keep screwing up, we keep finding new ways to do it. 
Uh, and that's growth, right? I mean, and that's the reality is, I don't think you can ever get away from it. If you do, you've moved out of the high growth startup phase because whenever you're pushing the limits, growing faster than it's comfortable, doing things that you are not really ready in some sense as a business to do, you're gonna hit that limit. You're gonna say, we didn't think about this in advance. We weren't ready for that. And I think that's the sign of growth and in kind of a positive trajectory, right? Now you don't want them to be like existential threats where she might destroy the business, but there's always those moments like, shoot, we forgot about whatever. It's just, I, the key to me is like, don't be doing the same one again. Like if, you, if that happens, you should learn from it. We do postmortems and we get together. So how are we make sure that, that never happens again? And that never happens again, but something else will come along that you didn't see coming and cause you to kind of be, uh, you know, be nervous on the edge. And I think that's okay, right? That's what, you talk about the roller coaster and why it's more exciting to do this than it is to work at a big company with a safe job. That's part of why. It's because you're always, what do they say about skiing? If you're not falling down, you're not, you're not really skiing fast enough, you're not learning, right? That, that panic inducing moment is you on the edge of your capabilities as a company and that's where growth happens, right? And so you've got to be prepared for that if you want to be pushing the boundaries of what you're capable of as a company. Any more questions? I've got a question. You got a question, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, so I, my background is finance, so I, questions kind of a little bit more finance related. Sure. One of the things I wanted to ask you is you said that you're doing about 160 million of loans a month. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty big number. Um, yeah. What is, so the question I was going to ask originally was what is some of the impediment to growth? Because you obviously need a lot of capital in order to make these loans. Yeah. But then you kind of, I think, also answered my question when you said that there's a secondary market for these loans that you're making. And yep. so there are investors out there that are looking for- About 80% of our loans are bought uh, within a couple of days of origination by a number of wholesale investors who buy large volumes of loans. So you can think of these as banks, uh, some different funds that have been set up that want the interest payments, right? And so that is, I mean, it's very expensive if you want to lend money to lend your own money, uh, right? So as a, if you raise equity dollars as a startup, that's very expensive capital and it's not very well used being lent out. Now we do lend some of our own money. Uh, and then we also go through what's called the securitization process. If we want to talk about securitization, I'm happy to do that. We securitize our loans about four times a year, roughly quarterly, we go through that process. So that's how we accumulate the funds. I will say our, our, our business is a balance though between having enough borrowers who want your loans and having enough capital that wants to be lent at the rates at which you're lending. And we have seesawed back and forth as to which is the growth limiting factor at various points in time. Although frankly now it's mostly on the borrower side, which is just to say there are a lot of lenders. Goldman Sachs has now entered my space with a product called Marcus, right? Uh, so there are people who are out there and you will find months. I, I know that one of my competitors called up one of our traffic sources recently and said, we'll, we'll double what we're paying you, right? So then we face the question is like, do we want to double what we're paying them, which is unprofitable for us or not, right? And we chose not. I, didn't, I don't like losing money, right? Um, I like making money, and so we chose to not grow as rapidly. And so you have competitors in the market who can act irrationally and cause you to need to slow down. And you have to re you have to choose how you react. That some people in that situation would go, no, let's spend the money because growth is important for my trajectory as a company, for my next fundraise, for whatever. I'm going to pursue it. We've not chosen that path generally, uh, but that's more or less where the, the primary inhibitors to growth come from today. Although we're growing pretty pretty nicely, so I wouldn't say we're too badly inhibited right now. Any last questions, other questions? Oh, a couple more. Just cut me off when I'm supposed to be done, like I'm not watching out of time. Uh, so this is more maybe a technical question, because I know you mentioned machine learning in terms of getting people credit. Um, and everybody seems to use machine learning now. And for example, uh, in the news, Amazon was using machine learning in terms of recruiting, and it turns, I guess, bias towards men uh, versus women. So. The question to you is, in terms of when you guys generate or uh, use machine learning in terms of giving credit to, to your, your users, how do you, or what are your plans to um, remove bias in terms of giving people credit or in terms of the terms you give them, for example? So it's a fabulous question. Um, it is one, so I'm actually on an AI ethics panel next week as part of Connect Week, so if you want, that's a whole hour long topic that'll just be about ethics and AI. It's a great question. There's some basic stuff you do like gender and ethnicity are not variables that the machine is allowed to look at. Right? That's a, I mean, that's kind of table stakes, right? Uh, the flip side is many things that you may look at are highly correlated to gender, ethnicity, race, things that you would not want to be part of a decisioning process. And so, there, you know, it's a hard question. Uh, what I will tell you is that we actually went through a multi-year process with the federal regulator in this space that's primarily interested with Fair Lane called the, well, they've got a new name. It used to be the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and I think it's now the uh, Bureau of Consumer Protection or something. They, they, uh, you know, they changed the name under the Trump administration. The same basic agency. 
And, and we went through a process that said, how do we evaluate this? And so what we really did is started to do testing on the outputs of our model. Right? We'll say, okay, there are some models that will estimate protected classes, gender, ethnicity, race, uh, and age, and uh, look at, are the outcomes I'm producing across those classes equitable? Right? Are they, am I proving people the same right? Am I getting similar interest rates to people in different categories? If not, are there differences in their actual credit performance that would justify the delta? So am I just getting a really adversely selected population within some group? And so, it, I mean, you've gotta be careful about how you construct the model that you're not giving it substantial opportunities to do this. I think you also have to be very careful that you are looking at the results on the tail end and understanding where that might actually come into the system, right? And then figuring out how you fix it if you do find it there. We have actually found that we have the opposite effect, uh, which is to say that if you look at FICO scores, FICO scores are not equitable across different classes, different genders and ethnicities in this country, right? If you are a minority, the odds are very high that your FICO score is lower than if you are a Caucasian person. And so what we have found is that we can actually uh, uh, you know, basically reverse some of that bias and allow a more equitable outcome by looking at a more holistic set of factors. But I will tell you, the first time we ran our fair lending test, we say, are we producing better or worse outcomes? We were pretty nervous because you know, it is not guaranteed that the answer is better. And then you gotta figure out how do we respond if, it, if it's not. And that's not an easy question, but I think it's one that involves thoughtful construction of models and choices of variables and understanding of selection biases and the training data sets that you're using up front, and then a careful analysis of the outputs on the tail end to look for any emergence of bias, and then a, a, obviously a rapid response if you do see that kind of emergence over time. And again, if you wanna to come to the panel and uh, grill us all, I think there's a bunch of machine learning ethics experts coming, so I feel a little outmatched in that particular panel, but happy to dive into that in more detail. <coughs> Last question, all right. Hey, Jeff, uh, my name is Arun. I have a question about, um, you know, going from an entrepreneur to entrepreneur, right? Yeah. When you're an entrepreneur, uh, projects are internally commissioned, or it was a CFO or CEO commission set, the fund kind of comes by. You know, when you go to an entrepreneur, how did you kind of switch gears and go to the investors and you had to raise funds? Plus, uh, when yep. you're in Google and IBM, it's a big company, right? Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of money to spend. You don't have to be scrappy. How did you kind of learn to be scrappy when you went to uh, went went, uh, went as an entrepreneur and upstart? Yeah, it's a great question. I actually, it's the two questions. I mean, shifting from you have to raise money internally with a big company too. You just have to raise it from somebody else, right? Like there's there's a CFO who has money. When you go to venture capitalists, they have money, right? Angel, I mean, it's, their whole business model is to have money. So there are people with money, but the pitch changes a little bit, right? Uh, Google, you know the mission, you know the vision, and so you can kind of fit into what they want to do. Uh, and where they want to go, and you can kind of make a more, a less business oriented pitch and a less immediate return on the business value kind of case, depending on what you need to do to, to raise the funds, um, you know, to get the commitment. Uh, you actually can have the opposite problem in a big company, which is like, you know, if your startup takes three years to get to $100 million revenue, like that's fine. If you take three years to get to $100 million revenue at Google, Google's like, what are we doing spending money on this thing? Like, if I went and put these 50 engineers on AdWords, I could turn the knob like this and we make, Billions of dollars, so like why should we invest there? So the problem can actually be the opposite, which is you kind of have to scale and show relevance to the big company in a way that a startup can be given, not infinite time, but a little bit more time to grow into what they're going to be. And that's a very real difference. But you kind of have to shift your mindset, right? To a little more business focus, a little more long-term, operational, and how you're going to structure your business to succeed. Because if, if the question is, we know the business will get really big, but how do you operationalize it? That is not a question that Google is concerned about. Right? They're going, we have people who know how to operationalize that, we'll be fine. If you go to VC, they're going, do you guys know how to actually run a business that's gonna have this kind of revenue and volume and op support and all this stuff? So you've got a different set of questions you have to answer, different set of concerns with Express. Um, the question of how you learn to be scrappy, it's a good one. Uh, moving out of your cushy office and not having catered lunch every day is a great start uh, to being scrappy. Uh, I actually think it's important, so I'm gonna reverse the question, which is I think learning scrappiness for the entrepreneur is actually the bigger problem. Because when you're an entrepreneur, you don't have a choice, right? Like you're sitting in a room by yourself or with your two co-founders. We started off, we were funded by Google Ventures. We were in one conference room and every day we sat in the same conference room around one table and looked at each other and we're like, better be doing something. Uh, we better go, you know, what are you gonna do today to make the business happen? Because nobody's gonna bring it to you. And that was a very real feeling. When you're an entrepreneur, it's actually harder in that it's easy to kind of go, well, you know, if it doesn't happen this quarter, it'll happen next quarter, product launches are missed all the time. Like, I can tell you, as an entrepreneur, I don't like this product launches. I get upset when this, like, we have to move fast. That's, you know, the, the, the vision, the mission, the way you operate. It's easy to fall into the kind of, oh, well, whatever, you know, I'm still making a good salary and a nice paycheck and nobody's gonna notice at a big company. And so I actually find that getting, for instance, a big company, a cross-functional team. So often, 
you know, my team and G Suite when I was at Google Apps, what we call it then, I actually had teams that report to four or five different people, right? I got my marketing person, my product manager, my engineers, my business development people, and then I'll report up in like the marketing and the product management and the engineering and the business development functions. And I said, no, you're not gonna sit with your business development team. We're going to go and we're going to sit as a group, right? And we are going to be in a different space and have a different feel and develop a culture as a team. And we're gonna set our values and our mission and our pace and the things we think are important as that team versus kind of ingesting too much of the attitude of the bigger company. So I think it's really important for an entrepreneur to figure out how to do that. And in many cases, you'll see successful uh, examples of entrepreneurship, right? Actually get spun off to separate brands, they have separate offices, they're allowed to operate as separate businesses because it's very hard to get that same kind of drive and cohesion inside of a big company that already has for better or for worse, a very established culture and processes, and they may need to be different for the kind of business you're entering. And so that, figuring out how to bring Scrappy into the big company is a bigger challenge, in my opinion, than figuring out how to transition Scrappy. Because like, you just don't have a choice, right? And you got six months of runway, if you're not Scrappy, you're looking at, you know, end of job, pretty correctly approaching you, right? That wall is gonna hit you no matter what, so you've gotta to get to the next level. You feel that urgency, right? In a way that you don't, at a big company where you're rounding error on the financial statement and, and figuring out how you drive that team sense of urgency in the big company can be, a, can be a big challenge. It's surmountable, but it's the one that's probably the harder to overcome. All right, I'm out of time for questions. Thank you all. Uh, if you want to talk a lot, I'll be here afterwards.